In this special seasonal instalment of our regular tips and tricks episodes, we're going to look at a rather unusual use for forest pack, adding snow to trees. It might not be the obvious choice of plugin for this task. After all, snow normally forms a continuous blanket-like mesh and forest pack scatters hundreds of thousands of individual items. But when coupled with a Metables plugin, forest pack can be used to add a covering of snow to high poly objects really quickly. In this tutorial, we'll examine two techniques for adding realistic snow to a tree, starting with covering only the branches that are visible to the sky and not occluded by one another. We'll then build upon this foundation to add a denser coating of snow by covering all of the trees upward facing polygons. And finally, we'll use the new snow covered tree assets to populate the small environment shown here. In this tutorial, we'll be using a free mature cedrus from our new summer trees collection. You can download the high quality free asset from the link in the written version of this tutorial. So the free sample is for a new summer collection of plants, but we're creating a winter scene. Fortunately, the cedrus tree is evergreen, retains its leaves and doesn't really look substantially different in the winter. So all we need to do is to cover it in snow. There are a few approaches used by artists for modeling snow. For example, there are some plugins available specifically for this purpose. Some people like to model snow by hand, but probably the most common is the use of PFLOW or another particle system to simulate snow accumulation. All of these techniques are perfectly fine, but they can be very slow when applied to high polygon meshes like a tree. The PFLOW technique in particular takes a long time to simulate, so why not use Forest Pack? As I mentioned, it might not be the obvious choice, but Forest Pack is fully multi-threaded and has the ability to scatter on surfaces. Best of all, we can control the distribution so that it only scatters on polygons which are facing upwards in world space and are not occluded by the geometry above them. This means you can get a natural distribution where only branches that are visible to the sky receive snow. Here's how it's done. So starting with our free sample file, let's duplicate the tree mesh. We're going to demonstrate two different techniques. We need something to scatter. Since we can't scatter particles or individual vertices, we'll use a simple plane object instead. So you should create a plane in the scene that's small enough to pick up enough of the detail in the tree, but without being so small that it creates an unmanageable amount of geometry. This takes a little experimentation, but for a tree of this size, a 4cm by 4cm plane works quite well. Make sure you set the plane's length and width segments to 1 to avoid unnecessarily increasing the poly count. Then create a new forest pack object by picking the tree as a surface. A message may appear asking if you want to limit the display to the camera view. Click no, we need to see all the objects for this technique to work. In the geometry rollout, add a new item and pick the little plane we created earlier from the scene. A few objects will be added to the tree, but we need more, a lot more. Remember, forest pack optimizes the viewport display when a polygon count exceeds a certain value. But for this technique, we need to see the full mesh so to fix this, go to the display rollout and enable viewport mesh. While we're here, let's add a zero or two to the maximum items value so that we can create a sufficient number of planes for the snow effect. Go to the distribution rollout and change the distribution map to full. This map is fully white, so it creates an item on every pixel. And it's 100 pixels per side, so it creates 10,000 objects in total. We know that the plane is 4 centimeters per side, and we know there will be 100 per side scattered by the distribution map. So by multiplying these two values together, we can find the size needed to create a grid with no spacing between the planes. 4 centimeters by 100 is 400 centimeters. So if we enter this for the size value, we'll get the correct dimensions. Of course, if you're not a lover of maths, you can just do this by eye. At present, all the planes are facing straight up. If you prefer, they rotate to follow the mesh, go to the surfaces rollout and change the normal slider to the middle, which is zero. After meshing, you'll get slightly different results by playing with this slider. There's no right or wrong, just feel free to experiment. At this point, you'll have planes resting on the branches that are visible to the sky. There are probably more of them at the top of the tree than the bottom, which you'd expect as the lower branches become obscured by those above them. Once this step is completed, we're ready to turn our collection of planes into a single continuous mesh, and for that, we turn to Blob Mesh. 3ds Max has a built-in compound object called Blob Mesh that can take any particle or poly input and turn it into a continuous mesh. When applied to a forest pack object, it will create a set of spheres, one for each vertex, and connect them together as if they were made of a soft, fluid material. Blob Mesh is notoriously slow, whether applied to a mesh or particles, so be patient with this section of the tutorial. A little later we'll look at using Frost for meshing, a commercial alternative that's multi-threaded and much, much faster. 
So first, let's isolate a portion of the forest pack object to experiment with the blob mesh values. It's too slow otherwise to allow for speedy updates. In the areas rollout, disable the surface. Add a new paint area and paint a spline to reveal just a little bit of the mesh, enough to get an idea of how the snow will look on a branch or two. Then go to the Create Geometry Compound Objects section. Choose Blob Mesh and click anywhere in the scene to create a new Blob Mesh object. On the Modify panel, there are three important parameters that determine the appearance of our snow. Those are Size, Tension and Evaluation Coarseness. Size determines the size of each metaball created per vertex. It should be large enough so that it intersects with its immediate neighbours. A size similar to the size of the plane or slightly larger tends to work quite well. Tension determines how relaxed the resultant mesh will be. Smaller values are more relaxed. And finally, evaluation coarseness sets the mesh resolution of the resultant geometry. Smaller sizes produce smoother, more dense meshes, but also longer calculation times. You should also turn on large data optimization. This can improve efficiency when over 2000 metaballs are created. Now you're ready to pick the forest pack object. In the blob object section, click pick and select forest pack object. Be careful not to pick the tree or your computer won't recover for probably a few years. When the simulation is complete, you can add a relax modifier to reduce the lumpiness slightly and create a more convincing appearance of snow. Feel free to experiment with the settings until you get a nice covering of snow on your scattered planes. When you're happy with how it looks in your sample branch, go back to the forest pack object, disable the paint area and re-enable the surface, and then wait. It might take a little while. As mentioned, blob mesh is slow, so you'll probably want to go make a cup of tea while this is calculating. Once the blob mesh is complete, all you need to do then is just open the material browser and apply a snow material. Then select the tree Go to attach and pick the snow mesh. We've now created a snowy tree with no particles or third party plugins. So this example only adds snow on unoccluded branches. When snowfall is persistent or it snows in breezy conditions, it tends to get into all the nooks and crannies a little more. In all these instances, it may be more appropriate to place snow on all of the parts of the branch that face upwards. Forest pack can help you here too. So start with the same setup as before, a 4cm plane, a 400cm distribution size and a full map. This time we're going to use the UVW coordinates of the mesh, but because the texel density may vary between the branches, leaves and other parts of the tree, in order to have a consistent size we'll temporarily add a UVW modifier. So pick the tree and apply a UVW map modifier. Set the type to box and the size for all three axes so that it's the same to give an even distribution. The actual size isn't important. Before applying forest pack to the tree, go to the surfaces rollout and enable limit by slope range. This will prevent the creation of objects on the underside of the branches and the leaves. You can adjust the angles to control to what extent objects are added to vertical polygons. Now reselect the forest pack object and change the surface mode to UV. Still in the surfaces rollout, add the tree to the surfaces list. It may take a minute or two to process it if it's a high polygon object. And when it's finished processing, you'll get planes on tops of all the branches. You can further refine this by adjusting the normal direction and the slope range. Now compared to earlier, as you can see, this creates a lot of planes, several of which are overlapping and very close together. To refine this a little bit so that the meshing tools don't have quite so much work to do, especially if you're going to use blob mesh, you can apply a vertex world modifier to the forest pack object. Set the distance to slightly less than the size of each plane to make sure that the vertices on each plane are not welded to themselves. Then apply a few of these stacked up to keep refining the mesh. It doesn't really matter if the topology is horrible because it's only the vertex positions that matter. Once you're happy, you can collapse this to an editable poly object if you're worried about accidentally triggering meshing updates later. I find it makes the whole thing a little bit more stable and speeds things up, especially if you're using blob mesh. Okay, so we're now ready to mesh. In the previous example, we used Max's native blob mesh tool, and you can use it again. But do be prepared to wait a little while due to the increased number of vertices. As an alternative, you can use other meshing tools like Thinkbox's Frost, which is extremely powerful and very fast. Here's how this one works. Go to the Create Geometry and then Thinkbox category and pick Frost and create a new Frost object in the scene. Frost gives you a lot more control compared to Blob Mesh. For this tutorial though, we'll keep it simple. Change the mode to Metaballs from the meshing rollout 
but feel free to experiment with the other modes because you'll get quite different effects. The size of the metaballs is controlled using the particle size radius setting. Change this to 4cm to match the size of our plane, or if you prefer a less bumpy effect you can try slightly larger sizes but you'll use, lose some of the contours of the original tree. You can now pick the forest pack object. There's no need to preview a section with frost, it's fast enough to see your changes quickly even when applied to the whole tree. Once you're happy with the coverage, to change the resolution of the mesh in frost you use the meshing quality settings. Increase or decrease the relative to maximum radius value to get the density that you need. Then when the simulation is complete, you can add a relax modifier to reduce the lumpiness slightly and create a more convincing appearance of snow. Finally, open the material editor and apply a snow material to the frost object. Then select the tree, make sure you remove the UVW map modifier because we don't need that anymore, and then attach the snow mesh. And as you can see, this was really quick. You don't get the slow simulation times associated with PFLOW or some of the other dedicated plugins. To finish up this tutorial, we'll add these trees along with some other assets created using the same techniques to complete a full scene. If you want to follow along, open Forest Pack Snow Max. The scene contains a house and a train. All we need to do is to add the trees. First of all, we need to import the snow-covered cedrus trees we created earlier. There are a few others that are already in the scene. These trees are quite high poly, so ideally we won't merge them into the scene, instead we can either convert them to proxies or simply use xrefs. Be aware though that forest colours randomised by element features aren't compatible with proxies, so if that's important, use xrefs instead, and in this example we'll use xrefs. So go to the file menu and select reference xref objects. Click the create xref record from file button and select the file containing from your trees, and then just click open. And now we have all our assets, we're ready to create the first scatter. To add the cedrus trees, create a new forest pack object by picking the terrain. Go to the surfaces rollout and add the other three terrains from the scene. As you can see, terrains don't necessarily need to be continuous, as long as they fill the gaps that can be seen from the camera view. Go to the geometry rollout and add the two snow covered trees we just referenced to the items list. With only a couple of trees, repetition could become obvious. Let's disguise that by randomizing the rotation and the scale. Go to the transform rollout and enable rotation and scale. Set the scale's minimum value to 30% and set the maximum value to 100%. These are already tall trees, we don't need them any bigger. To change the number of trees, adjust the distribution map density size property. A value of about 150 meters works well for me. At the moment, some of the trees are growing on the cliff face. Let's limit where they can grow based on the angle of the surface. To do this, go to the surfaces rollout and enable slope range and limited. Lower the maximum angle until you've removed the trees from the steep cliff faces. I went for about 40 degrees. And then finally, to clear the trees from the area in front of the house so that it is visible to the camera, go to the areas rollout and add a new paint area. Change the mode to exclude activate the brush and paint in the scene to remove trees. If you need to adjust the size of the brush, just open the brush options. You can also remove the trees from the cliff behind the house because they really look too large to be growing there. Finally, to shrink the trees as they get closer to this clearing, enable scale fall off and change the exclude distance to five meters. This will stop them from becoming too overbearing near the camera. At the moment, the trees shrink to nothing as they get closer to the exclude spline. To make it so that they only decrease to about two thirds of their size, edit the fall off curve and reduce the scale on the right hand side of the graph as shown here. And then finally, let's optimize the scene a bit. Go to the camera rollout and check that the V-Ray camera is assigned. If it's assigned, it will automatically remove any trees that are not going to be visible in the render. And our cedrus trees are now done. Next, we can fill in the gaps and add some interest with some smaller trees. To save some time, instead of starting from scratch, we can simply duplicate the existing forest pack object and then swap the scattered geometry and adjust the settings to add smaller trees. So with the existing forest pack object selected, hit Ctrl and V to create a duplicate and make sure you choose Copy. Then go to the geometry rollout and swap the existing trees for the two small Christmas type trees and then the bare tree with no leaves. 
So I found that the scatter doesn't look quite right with a totally random distribution of trees. Instead, we'll create small clusters of trees that are the same species. To do this, we'll change the ID color of the two Christmas trees so that they're both the same. This will allow us to group them together using diversity modes. If we want to preview these colors in the viewport, you need to go to the display rollout and enable view color IDs. Now we can go to the distribution map rollout and reduce the density size to add more trees. About 58 meters works for me. We also want to disable the scale fall off options while we're here. We don't need these for the small trees. And then as we mentioned, to create groups of the same types of trees, we can come in here and change the diversity mode to clusters. To create smaller groups, change the size to 12 meters. At the moment, the small trees will be intersecting the cedrus trees. So to prevent this, we can add the first forest pack object as an exclude area. To do that, go to the areas rollout and click on the button with a little tree on it to add a new forest area. Then pick the existing forest pack object from the scene. This mode excludes objects using a collision sphere that's calculated using the bounding box of the nested items. We really only want to exclude the area just around the trunk, so you can reduce the scale a little bit to reduce the size of the collision volume. Finally, let's adjust the paint area so that the small trees occupy the space immediately in front of the camera. Select the existing paint area and pick the eraser tool. Paint the area in front of the camera so that you're framing the view of the building. Also, unlike the massive cedrus trees, these small trees won't look out of place on the cliff. So to add them back there, using the eraser button again, delete the parts of the spline that cover the area behind the house. You can also experiment with the surface settings. For example, changing the maximum surface angle adds a few more trees to the steep sections of the terrain. And adjusting the direction slider, you can make the trees slightly follow the normal direction of the terrain as well. And then finally, to add a bit more variety in the size of these trees, change the scale minimum size to 50% and the maximum to 150. To finish this scene, we'll add some ground cover using small snow-covered shrub-like plants in between the existing trees. And we'll do this by once again duplicating the previous forest pack object. Then go to the geometry rollout, remove the existing trees and add the small shrub model. There's only one. In the transform rollout, change the maximum size to 120%. We don't need these plants to be so large. Also, enable translation randomization to help break up the grid-like effect you can get when using dense patches for ground cover. In the surfaces rollout, change the direction to zero so that the plants follow the terrain surface normal direction. Delete all the surfaces except the terrain nearest the camera. We can't see these small plants in the background, so we can optimize the scene a little by removing them from those areas. Then go to the distribution rollout and change the map type to full to create more plants. Change the density size to 42 meters. And then let's stop these plants from growing through the small trees, just like we did earlier. In the areas rollout, add another new forest area and then pick the existing small trees forest object from the scene. Reduce the collision size to roughly 10% so that only the trunks are excluding objects. Then select the existing paint layer and use the paint and erase brushes to distribute plants in front of the camera. And then finally, to reduce the size of the plants as they approach the edge of this paint area, enable scale fall off for the include and exclude areas and set the distance for both to about one meter. Then edit the fall off curve so that the plants reduce to about 10% of their original size as they approach the perimeter. It will help to make it look as though they are becoming slowly submerged in the snow. That's the scene finished. We've created our own snow-covered assets and then used Forest Pack to distribute them using a combination of techniques for scattering, including surfaces, slope angle, hand-painted areas, and fall-off curves. Here's how the final render looks with a couple of other assets added to bring it to life. This is a very quick technique for applying snow to high polygon trees, but really you can use it for anything. The snow was also placed on the building using the same technique, and it was placed on the car that was in this render too. In fact, anything that would normally take too long to simulate and is seen in the mid-ground to background is a great candidate for this approach. If you do need more detail, we'll soon be releasing a winter version of this library, which uses a more advanced particle technique for proper snow accumulation. Until then, you can see all our existing tutorials on the website, and if you use these tutorial files or the techniques shown in this tutorial for your work, we'd love to see them on the forum. <laughs>